Good afternoon. Our first item of business today is portfolio questions. Finance and the Constitution, and we'll start with question number one from Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the North Sea oil revenues were for 2016-17 and how this compares to the projections in its 2013 document, Scotland's Future. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. <clears throat> Scotland's future made clear that tax revenues from oil and gas production will depend on a range of different factors, including future production in the North Sea, wholesale oil and gas prices and profitability. The Scottish Government presented a range of forecasts for oil and gas revenues based on information which was in line with external projections at the time. No organisations forecast a subsequent sharp decline in the oil price, which led to a period of record low profitability in the North Sea and a fall in oil and gas revenues. Encouragingly, uh, there is increasing evidence of cautious optimism returning to the oil and gas sector, and the Scottish Government will continue to do everything within its powers to support the industry and its workforce as it emerges from the downturn. Jamie Green. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I think what he failed to tell Parliament was that the document predicted up to £8 billion in oil revenues in his forecast. The actual number was just £208 million, just 2.7% of the forecast. I was hoping for an apology, perhaps, from the Cabinet Secretary there. Given that it, this isn't the great panacea that he was thinking in that document, it is actually the case that Scotland is now sitting with an 8.3% deficit. Given the impact that this has on inward investment into Scotland, when does the Cabinet Secretary project Scotland's deficit to be reduced to below 3% of GDP? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, Scotland's uh, notional deficit is uh, reducing. But I have to say, as that uh, criticism about the forecasts on oil and gas, does that same criticism uh, apply to the UK government, whose forecasts were higher than the Scottish government? Or is Mr Green not aware of that uh, assessment uh, at... The time. You see, the Tories scoff whilst the industry asks for actions. Yeah. In oil and gas, it's too little, too late, and 40 years of mismanagement of Scotland's resources has ensured we've lost out to the tune of £328 billion. So the Tory government is failing industry completely, in sharp contrast to a nation like Norway, independent Norway, with reserves of hundreds of billions of pounds that they can invest in their public services whilst we wait for action from the UK government on oil and gas. Question number two, Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will respond to the recommendations of the Barclay Review of uh, non-domestic rates. Cabinet Secretary. I propose to update Parliament in a statement next week and have committed to publishing an implementation plan by the end of 2017. Lee MacArthur. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. He'll be aware that many in the pub and hotel trade, including key businesses in my own Orkney constituency, have seen their rates bills rise exponentially in recent months. You'll therefore understand their frustration that the Barclay Review appears to offer little light at the end of the tunnel. Does he accept that an assessment based on turnover rather than the full accounts of such businesses is likely to penalise those who have invested and wish to grow their business? Does he recognise that such an approach will do nothing to help generate jobs, wages and tax revenues? And will he therefore undertake in responding to the Barclay Review next week to find a more appropriate way of taxing pubs and hotels which remain a linchpin of the tourism sector that is so vital to the economy of Orkney and Scotland as a whole? Cabinet Secretary. Disappointed that Liam MacArthur either understands and is misleading us, but I'm sure that's not the case, or doesn't understand the position of the methodology the assessors choose to use in assessing the hospitality sector, and particularly within that, um, licensed premises. That's a matter for them. Methodology is a matter for them. They are independent of Scottish Government. But of course I have intervened to support the hospitality sector following the revaluation, having taken early actions before that in terms of the poundage, a small business bonus and a large business supplement. But that specific real terms cap for hospitality, I do think, uh, was very well received and I propose to make an announcement on that as well as the other uh, non-domestic rates matter when I hopefully, uh, with Parliament's agreement, make that statement next week. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Barclay Review suggests introducing rates relief for nurseries, 
Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he will be taking forward this recommendation to help make childcare more affordable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will, and further detail will follow in the statement I hope to give to Parliament. Thank you. Question number three, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, officer, I think I may know the answer to this already, but can I ask the Scottish Government when it will publish its response to the Barclay Review of non-domestic rates? Cabinet Secretary. Hopefully next week. Murdo Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? There are many uh, sensible recommendations in the Barclay Review, but one issue that has raised concern is the proposal to levy business rates on charitable bodies, including uh, local authority-provided leisure centres, swimming pools, gyms and other sports clubs. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how such a proposal, which would lead to such uh, bodies having to increase their user charges, square with government policy to encourage active lifestyles and tackle obesity? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, not today, Mr Fraser, not today, but in the statement that I'll outline to Parliament, I hope to cover uh, all the issues in terms of the recommendations from uh, the Barclay report. But what I will continue to do is engage with stakeholders and consult, as Mr Fraser would expect. And I would also encourage all political parties, and not least the Conservatives, uh, to offer me a submission before next week. And I can maybe consider the constructive suggestions that may well be forthcoming from other political parties, especially when I've become aware uh, that the Tories didn't actually submit a submission to the Barclay Review. Ooh. So they seem to make a lot of noise. Oh. <laughs> I don't need to make a submission to the Barclay <laughs> Review. I'm the minister <laughs> and responsible for finance and the Scottish Government. It seems to pass the Tories uh, by. So I will engage constructively with all the other political parties if they want to put a submission to me to consider before I make that statement to Parliament, I'm all ears. But on this and many other issues, the Tories make a hell of a lot of noise, but not a lot of progress. <laughs> Jackie Bailey. I'm very glad the Minister is all ears, because when I last engaged with the Finance Secretary on business rates, he told me that the cap of 12.5% applies in the current financial year only, and he would consider this further after the Barclay Report. He, of course, has the Barclay Report. I suspect he's not going to tell me today, but let me ask anyway. Will the cap end on the 31st of March, yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. I have already said that I'll give a full statement to Parliament, hopefully next week, subject to the agreement of Parliament's business managers and I look forward to the comprehensive and all-encompassing submission from the Labour Party. <laughs> the Labour Party also didn't submit a submission to the Barclay Review. And that is right. That is right. The Scottish Government delivered uh, relief, much needed relief to the hospitality sector as well as a range of other interventions amounting to relief to over £600 million in business rates support to this country all of which were opposed by the Conservatives and the Labour Party, yeah, whilst the SNP yeah. stood up for business. Question for Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent commentary on JERS, Government Expenditure and Revenue Scotland figures, what its position is on the recent JERS report and the robustness of the findings within it. Cabinet Secretary. JERS provides estimates of revenue raised in Scotland and spending for Scotland under the current constitutional arrangements. It is a national statistics publication which has been independently assessed and found to be produced in accordance with the Code of Practice for official statistics. This assessment covers a number of areas including the quality of the statistics and their suitability to the needs of users. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the ONS publication that shows that Scotland's notional fiscal position is broadly similar to the UK average when London and the South East of England are excluded. Does he agree with me that this is a clear demonstration of the failure of the UK economic policy that prioritises one city at the expense of all other areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do believe with that statement the Westminster Government has for too long focused investment in London. And despite this, Scotland's revenue per head is the fourth highest in the UK and Scotland's notional deficit as a share of GDP is better than that of Wales, Northern Ireland and many English regions. James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the importance of growth in Scotland compared with growth 
in the UK in relation to the block grant adjustment for future uh, Scottish budgets. Uh, does he therefore agree with me that it's a concern that associated with the latest GERS figures, we saw that tax revenues were growing at one point, have grown by 1.5% in the rest of the UK, but have only increased by 0.92% in Scotland. And if that trend continues, that could have a detrimental effect on the block grant adjustment. What action is he going to take to ensure that, tax revenue, that growth in tax revenues increases and therefore economic growth uh, grows? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm sure Mr Kelly would welcome the government's economic strategy as well as the measures outlined in the programme for government uh, just yesterday. And I'm sure that Mr Kelly will also welcome record high employment, near record low unemployment, progress on GDP, outstripping the GDP of the UK, almost four times the rate of GDP growth in the last quarter, record foreign direct investment, improvement in productivity, and of course, North Sea revenues rising once again. There are a range of economic and industrial interventions that this government uh, is making to support our economy, improve productivity, and that will in turn help grow our economy so that we have the resources to deliver our very valued public services. Question number five, Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the impact of Brexit on Scotland's public finances. Minister Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Brexit threatens around 80,000 Scottish jobs and could cost our economy more than 11 billion a year by 2030. This presents a significant risk to Scotland's public finances. It's therefore essential that the Scottish Government have a direct role in the negotiations to ensure that any Brexit deal is in the interest of Scotland's economy and public services. We have confirmed that we will be passing on the current UK government guarantees on EU funding in full to Scottish stakeholders to provide stability and certainty for key sectors of the Scottish economy. We'll continue to press the UK government to confirm how these guarantees will operate in practice and on what the replacement funding arrangements will be once the UK has left the EU. Graham D. I thank the Minister for the answer, but can I ask you what concerns you might have over the financial implications of the UK government's attempt in the EU withdrawal bill to reverse devolution and give Westminster control over devolved policy areas such as fishing, agriculture and the environment? Minister. The proposals in the withdrawal bill, as the First Minister indicated in the statement yesterday, are unacceptable to the Scottish Government, uh, and of course uh, that is the position that the Welsh Government has taken too. Uh, clearly if frameworks were to be established without consultation, and that is the proposal from the UK Government, uh, then the financial implications of those frameworks would also cause considerable worry. The best way to take this issue forward is for the UK withdrawal bill to be amended so that it would be acceptable to uh, the Scottish Government, and that's a recommendation we could then make to this chamber. Uh, and I do hope the UK Government is listening to that reasonable point of view. Thank you. Question number six, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it, is, it has made of the recent JERS figures. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Uh, GERS provides estimates of revenue raised in Scotland and spending for Scotland under the current constitutional arrangements. The results show that the lower oil price had an impact on North Sea revenues and the wider economy last year. However, it is encouraging to see an improvement in the overall notional fiscal balance and the onshore revenues grew at their fastest rate in cash terms in nearly 20 years. However, a long-term economic success is now threatened by Brexit which risks reducing household incomes, employment and funding for public services. And this is why we continue to press for the Scottish Government to have a direct role in the Brexit negotiations. Edward Mountain. Uh, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The GERS figures show that public spending in Scotland is some £1,400 per head higher than the UK average, thanks to the funding settlement that Scotland has with the UK Government. If it is still the Scottish Government's policy to dismantle that funding settlement, what level of economic growth would be required and over what timescale? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government's made clear through our economic strategy that we want to grow the economy. But what Mr Mountain is trying to do, that what Mr Mountain is trying to do is to make a jump from pretending that these figures under the current constitutional arrangements relate to independence when he should know that the Fraser of Allender Institute has pointed out that it tells us about the current 
constitutional arrangements and nothing yeah. else. You know, over the course of the summer, presiding officer, you, you maybe do things that you don't always have the time to do, like check out the Scotland Office Twitter feed, oh. uh, which uh, oh. that we look at. And when it came down to who's responsible for the Scottish economy, the Scotland Office pointed out that the UK government has responsibility ah. for the economy. Oh, Jobs, opportunity <laughs> and currency. But the Scottish Government has responsibility for health, uh, sorry, skills and uh, enterprise. So in all the actions we are taking that's helping us deliver uh, GDP growth that's outstripping the UK, higher employment levels, more foreign direct investment, improvement on productivity, <laughs> investment on digital and North Sea revenues increasing once again. These are because of the actions this government is taking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This government yeah, yeah, is taking. Yeah, yeah. And anyone who looks at the jail's figures and concludes that everything is fine and should be left as they are should look again. We could do so much more with the powers of independence. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, sir. Marie Todd. Thank you, presiding officer. Would the cabinet secretary agree with me that the key risks to Scottish public spending come from the UK government's austerity programme? Cabinet secretary. Yes, I find myself in agreement uh, with yeah, that are. comment. That's not just a, a philosophical uh, argument. It's the reality that the UK government has cut Scotland's discretionary budget by £2.8 billion in real terms since 2010-11. That's funding for the day-to-day -day public services of Scotland, and it'll be further cut if the Tories get their way by over £600 million in real, real terms between 2016-17 and 2019-20. And I hear Murdo Fraser saying it's scaremongering. No, it's not. It's a reality under the Conservatives, which will be opposed by the SNP every step of the way. Yeah, yeah. Question number seven, Adam Tompkins. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what work it has undertaken in preparation for new schemes of shared governance in the UK that may result from Brexit. Uh, presenting officer, we've made clear in Scotland's place in Europe, the Scottish Government recognises that it may be necessary to establish arrangements for cooperation across the UK in some areas currently covered by EU law. We're currently assessing where such needs may exist. And together with the Deputy First Minister, I am in discussions with the First Secretary of State and the Secretary of State for Scotland with a view to agreeing principles which are a necessary starting point for cooperation on these matters. Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. So that, that is an answer to the question that the Minister could have given several months ago. The question is, what specific proposals for new regimes of shared governance in the United Kingdom have the Scottish Government brought forward since June 2016? Minister. Well, uh, Presiding Officer, I would have thought that it is the UK Government that is uh, uh, embarked upon this project of leaving the EU. If it wishes to change the schemes, if it wishes to change the schemes of shared governance, it should bring those forward. Uh, what it has done is, <laughs> Presiding Officer, it is quite important that there is a debate and dialogue about this, and it is possible for the government's point of view to be heard, and then Mr. Tomkins can shout what he wants from the sidelines. The reality of the situation is that the UK government has come forward with a bill which is unacceptable, which would not work, which breaches the principles of devolution, and which unfortunately will create circumstances in which the powers of this parliament will be considerably diminished. I, for one, will not accept that. I don't think that the responsible parties in this part of parliament will accept it if the Scottish Conservatives are now so reduced to being the poodle of the UK government that they would even accept that then I think the people of Scotland will draw their own conclusions. Richard Lockhead. Observing the inter-government negotiations over Brexit from a distance, it appears that even though often the UK ministers are in the same room as the devolved administrations, they're not actually listening to devolved ministers. Therefore, when it comes to talk of shared uh, governance and new schemes to make that happen, will the minister give us an assurance that that will be on the basis of a mutual agreement between the devolved administrations and the UK government and not a means by which the UK government can undermine Scottish devolution? Minister. Uh, the member is right, but the term shared governance is very interesting. It's been introduced into this debate, I think, for the first time by Mr. Tompkins. The UK government has never proposed shared 
the UK government has never proposed shared governance, and indeed my discussions with the UK government on uh, issues of, around this bill have made it clear that there can be no discussion of shared governance. So I'm afraid that uh, uh, there is some misleading going on here. The reality is that the Scottish government is absolutely willing to sit down to discuss the principles that would govern frameworks and to move together by joint agreement on those issues. Uh, there has been no such proposal from the UK government. I regret that, but I certainly will not be pressured either by the UK government or by Professor Tomkins shouting from the sidelines into betraying this parliament or devolution. And if you're brief, I'll squeeze in Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the House of Lords put together an excellent uh, report on the impact of Brexit on the devolved nations. I've been pursuing this question for some time about what say Scotland might get in a future immigration policy. But what I'd like to know from the Minister this afternoon is what specific talks they've had with the government and do they see any light at the end of the tunnel on this important matter given our heavy reliance on EU uh, immigration? Minister. That is a very good point indeed. The Scottish Government published its response to the UK Government proposals on migration uh, a couple of months ago. I think every one of us would be astonished and shocked and deeply worried by the leaked proposals from the Home Office today. The, idea, the issue of migration was raised on a number of occasions in the Joint Ministerial Committee. We made no progress because the UK Government did not wish to discuss the idea of migration. It regarded it as reserved exclusively to itself. And when there is a prime minister who is an extreme hardliner on issues of migration, then that will probably continue to be the case. I look to work with all those parties who wish to work in the same direction in this chamber to make two things clear. Firstly, there must be discussion of these issues with the UK government. And secondly, we must be prepared to say openly and clearly that migration is a positive benefit to Scotland. It makes our society richer, it contributes financially, it is culturally and socially important to us. And those voices who are now talking about migration in the negative terms we hear are utterly unacceptable. I am absolutely certain I can work with the member on those because I know she absolutely holds those views true, as do members of the Labour Party and many others in the chamber. Regrettably, I've not heard them recently from members of the Tory party. Apologies to Andy Whiteman and Gail Ross. I'm unable to, unable to reach the questions. We now move to economy, jobs and fair work. Question number one has not been lodged. Question number two, Alison Johnson. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether the fair work framework applies to NHS Lothian. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Yes, all employers are encouraged to adopt and promote the principles of the fair work framework. This includes all NHS boards. Alison Johnson. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. The framework speaks of giving opportunities for hours of work that can align with family life and caring commitments. However, the Minister may be aware that computerised rostering in certain NHS departments and wards has removed the flexibility that has enabled many long-serving NHS employees to combine work and family life. And the withdrawal of this flexibility is leaving staff with no alternative in many situations but to leave the NHS. You know, it's just very difficult for them to afford shift-friendly childcare, for example. Um, and, and their leaving is the last thing we need or want. So will the minister help me make sure that the framework policies are actually being delivered on the ground in the NHS? Minister. Well, uh, let me say uh, uh, the uh, issue of family uh, Flexible working is one that this government takes very seriously. That's why we are, for example, a member of the uh, partnership, uh, the Family uh, Flexible Working uh, Scotland Partnership. We're a full member and we uh, fund that work in relation to uh, the concerns that uh, have been raised by Alison Johnson about the impact of the overall workforce. I would observe that actually we have more uh, staff working in the workforce uh, now than we have uh, in the past, but the, nonetheless, uh, I take on board the point that she makes. We, as an administration, promote uh, flexible working arrangements to our own uh, workforce. If there's a particular issue that she has identified in the NHS Lothian uh, area, I'll be very happy to, to hear from her. Of course, NHS Lothian is uh, an employer in its own right, but yes, she can write to me and I'll be happy to investigate that matter. Question number two, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it can offer to companies affected by the downturn in the North Sea oil and gas industry, that are not based in the North East. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, I attended Offshore Europe 2017 on Tuesday with the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, uh, and at that event uh, we met with individuals and companies 
operating across the whole of Scotland, who are showcasing a range of technologies, products and services used in the oil and gas industry, both in the North Sea and globally. Many of these companies are benefiting uh, from support and account management services provided by Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And this supplements, of course, relevant support received through business gateway services delivered through local authorities. In addition, our £12 million transition training fund has funded training opportunities for more than 2,400 individ individuals in the sector faced with redundancy, with additional training programmes procured by the fund looking to create over 700 employment opportunities across Scotland. We've also provided a further £12.5 million to support innovation and business resilience. Uh, this support is available to businesses across Scotland. Uh, this included £10 million of SE funding to help firms take forward vital research and development to support innovation and improved productivity and to date around 111 innovation projects with a total project value of £43 million have benefited from increasing funding of around £16 million of Scottish Government support so far. We have also provided targeted support for business resilience reviews from industry experts with over £2.5 million invested uh, in that commitment to, uh, to date. Uh, our competitive uh, non-domestic rates package also targets support where it is most needed including around £660 million of rates relief this year. And following the Community Empowerment Act, councils are now, of course, able to apply further targeted reductions in business rates in response to the local economy's needs. Ask Cole Hamilton. I thank the Minister for his answer. I'm also grateful for the time given to me by his colleague Keith Brown when we met in June to discuss the difficulties faced by Edgin Murray Europe, a significant employer in my constituency who manufactures steel components exclusively for the oil industry. they just seen a prohibitive rise in business rates during the, one of the worst periods in their history. Not being based in the North East, they don't qualify for the kind of support that firms based there currently do. They aren't alone. And so what additional help can the government offer to those specific companies outside of the North East who depend on the oil and gas sector but who are struggling in the current environment? Minister. Well, I certainly would be happy to discuss the needs of the individual business that uh, Alex Cole Hamilton raises in regard to his own constituency. Uh, certainly, as uh, myself and, the, and Keith Brown are involved closely in the work of the Steel Task Force and looking to support those uh, businesses that are working in steel, not just in the oil and gas industry, obviously, but more widely in the economy. And there may be measures we can take to support through that route. But in regard to business rates, uh, the member will have heard the Finance Secretary refer to his statement, which is coming up shortly in Parliament, and we'll see more in response to the Barclay Review. And I would hope between uh, the work that uh, the camp, uh, finance secretary can do on business rates and the work that uh, the economy team can do in regards to supporting individual businesses using the enterprise agencies who can help support the important employer in Edinburgh West that Alex Cole Hamilton raises. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that UK Government's lack of support for the oil and gas industry, most recently evidenced by the failure to appoint an oil and gas ambassador, is shameful and harmful to the companies and the workforce in this industry? Minister. Well, uh, I would certainly uh, refer to the, to the question that's raised by Claire Adamson. In, in January 2016, uh, the, in a pre-election mode, perhaps, the uh, previous Prime Minister, David Cameron, gave a UK government commitment to appoint an oil and gas ambassador to help ensure the best possible access uh, for Scottish and UK companies to markets overseas. Uh, this has not clearly been fulfilled, uh, a point of embarrassment to Richard Harrington when he appeared in Aberdeen last week. Uh, however, Scottish Development International, importantly, continues to work with Scottish companies to offer significant financial incentives and other assistance to help businesses uh, access international markets. But the lack of support from the UK government is indeed concerning in this respect, uh, particularly when the industry has set itself an ambitious target to generate additional revenue of over £290 billion by extending the life of the North Sea and maximising supply chain sales to international export markets. So it's important we uh, get our act together collectively between the UK government and the Scottish government. I'm confident we're doing everything we can. Uh, we need to see the UK government follow through as well. Question number four, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how the youth employment rate in Scotland compares to the UK as a whole and the rest of the EU. Minister Jamie Hepburn. If Scotland performed strongly in youth employment compared against both the UK and the rest of the EU. The latest statistics published by the Office for National Statistics on 16th of August and covering April to June show that Scotland's youth employment rate is 5.3 percentage points higher than that for the UK as a whole. Uh, the most recently available internationally comparable data show that Scotland has the third highest youth employment rate of the EU28 countries and Scotland's youth unemployment rate was the third lowest of the EU28 countries in quarter two 2017 compared with 14th highest in quarter two in 2007. James Dornan. 
I thank the Minister for that very positive response. Can the Minister provide detail on what support has been given to young people in Scotland to help them find work? Minister. Uh, well, what I, I can uh, say, uh, President Officer, is that each year uh, over £8 billion pounds is spent in Scotland between uh, the Scottish Government and its agencies uh, and local government in all forms uh, and across all stages of, of learning and, and training. This, of course, ensures that our young people are best placed to take advantage of opportunities in the workforce. The, the latest uh, annual participation measure report, which published uh, last month, it shows that our policies are, are working with 91.1% of 16 to 19 year olds participating in learning, training or, or work. As I've uh, just set out, President Officer, the labour market is uh, performing uh, well uh, in Scotland uh, and our focus now is uh, helping those who face the greatest barriers uh, to work. We're doing this through our youth employment strategy, which is implementing the developing the young uh, workforce recommendations and another range of measures as well. For example, since 2011, we provide the SCVO with over £50 million to deliver Community Jobs Scotland programme. Uh, that uh, programme has supported more and 7,500 young people into job training opportunities across all 32 local authority uh, areas. We uh, have also, with uh, an aim of uh, providing long-term investment for maximum uh, social return, we've uh, since 2008 invested uh, £36.44 million in inspiring Scotland's 14 uh, to 19 fund, working uh, with uh, third sector organisations. Uh, that uh, fund uh, has to date supported 27,000 people uh, young people into a positive destination. And of course, we uh, continue support for local authorities to deliver activity agreements, which are a, a key component of the Opportunities for All offer. And uh, uh, last year, we saw an increase in progressions from activity uh, agreements to positive uh, destinations. So there's clear uh, positive signs, but of course, uh, this entire chamber can be assured that uh, this remains an important focus of my work. Jimmy Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, does the Minister agree that youth unemployment remains a significant challenge? And if so, how does he justify the cuts to skills and training uh, in this year's budget? Minister. Uh, well, uh, let me first of all welcome Mr Halcrow uh, Johnson to uh, his place. I think this is the first uh, opportunity we've had to, to interact with one another in terms of his uh, role. Uh, I, uh, I've just set out a, a, a considerable range of activity we are uh, undertaking. I've also set out, and uh, I do uh, concede, of course, given our ongoing uh, commitment to uh, this agenda, that uh, there are uh, particular uh, areas that we need to focus on in terms of uh, youth uh, unemployment. But uh, we are uh, moving in the uh, right direction. We are continuing to invest significant resource and training uh, uh, objectives. That's uh, why, for example, uh, this year we'll be increasing the number of modern apprenticeship uh, places available for, for instance, with additional revenue going to that. So um, uh, let me uh, say to Mr Halcrow Johnson, he can be reassured despite his failure to welcome where we are right now, that uh, as I said to this entire chamber, this remains a considerable uh, focus of my role. Question number five, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government how the performance of the economy is affected by the property market. Camera Secretary Keith Brown. The property market plays an important role in the Scottish economy. The real estate sector accounted for 10.6% of Scotland's economy in terms of gross value added, and also grew by 1.7% in real terms during 2016. Uh, that measure covers not only services provided by estate agents, but also the economic value added from rental and owner-occupied housing, as well as commercial property. I'm happy to provide more detailed information on those subsectors if those are behind the question which the member has asked. Additionally, Scottish Government statistics show that over £8.3 billion was spent in 2016 on the construction of new dwellings or improvements to dwellings. A well-functioning property market also contributes indirectly to economic performance. The availability of affordable housing improves the functioning of the labour market by enabling thousands of households to take advantage of job opportunities in different parts of Scotland. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, this summer the Scottish housing market was in a serious slowdown, uh, reportedly stagnating in July, and policies of this government, such as the land and buildings transaction tax, are stifling investment at the middle and higher end of the market, mm. um, resulting in lack of mobility to allow people to purchase lower-priced homes. Now, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that to improve the economy, the government needs to fully reform its approach to taxation and taxes such as the LBTT? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, well, I should say that uh, questions around the LBTT are really from a colleague, uh, Derek Mackay, but I would say that in relation to uh, the housing statistics the member mentions, uh, the, he will have seen, of course, the Prosperity Index, which was recently published, and it said, said that more stable growth in house prices in Scotland than the rest of the UK contributes to greater affordability of housing. It also says in the first seven months of this year, residential transactions over 40,000 were up by an annual 5% in Scotland compared to 4% in Wales and 3% in Northern Ireland. In England, of course, they were down 6%. So I think there is some evidence of uh, success and also in relation to the fact that LBTT does advantage those further down uh, the housing chain, which is very good, as I mentioned, for employment. And one final thing to say on housing growth and how it affects uh, the property. I have been overwhelmed by Conservative congratulations and good wishes about the completion of the Queen's Ferry Crossing, but they will know that in relation to that project, the Chambers in Fife, Chambers of Commerce and others, developers, are very keen to see how they can maximise the benefits of Scottish Government and investment and in infrastructure for the benefit of the housing market. And I would thought that would be welcomed by the Conservative benches. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. I have got a question for the Cabinet Secretary on LBTT. Whether the ongoing monitoring of LBTT by the Scottish Fiscal Commission will take into account consideration of the impact, uh, take into consideration the impact of the property market on the economy. This might be for the other Cabinet Secretary, but Mr Brown. Yes, I would just repeat that point. Obviously, uh, Derek Mackay is responsible for that. But in its previous devolved taxes uh, forecasting role, and for other reasons, the Scottish Government closely monitors, obviously, LBTT transactions and the revenues that we have mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. And these are, of course, as has been mentioned, highly dependent on conditions in both the housing market and the wider economy. The Scottish Fiscal Commission, as a member knows, is independent from government, and it's therefore a matter for the Commission to determine its approach to fulfilling its remit. Uh, the Commission published its first uh, its forecast evaluation report for 2016-17 and outlined its current approach to forecasting in separate publications on Tuesday. It should, it should make the point that LBTT, as I was trying to say to the previous member, minimises the impact on the property market by ensuring everyone buying a property property under £325,000 pays no tax or less tax yeah. than under the UK stamp duty yeah. land tax. And by taking up to 10,000 house purchases out of tax, exactly. that's us, the Scottish Government, taking 10,000 mm -hmm. houses out of Great tax. Sense. That would be a tax cut mm -hmm. uh, in Tory language. Uh, we have, of course, uh, a 0% upper tax threshold of £145,000. Right. So these are things to help address the housing market in Scotland, and in particular, the affordable uh, housing market in addition to what we're doing in terms of social housing as well. And I think it's a good track record from the Scottish Government. Question number six, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the impact has been of the capital acceleration programme. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government's £100 million capital stimulus has helped to support jobs and business activity across the Scottish economy at a time when economic uncertainty was heightened as a result of the EU referendum. Mm -hmm. Such investment, which includes £10 million to support the delivery of capital projects for local economic development, provides the assets and infrastructure which will support future economic growth in Scotland. Jackson Carlo. Thank the Minister for that response. Silly, still, while he's still in his seat, can I also congratulate the Finance Secretary on his recent 40th birthday? Doesn't look a day over 50. Um, can I ask the Minister... Can I ask the Minister, when this uh, capital acceleration fund was launched, um, he indicated that there was an additional £100 million of funding in that particular financial year. Can he confirm how much of that £100 million was actually accessed and whether that continues to be available in the forthcoming year and in future years? And if not, why not? Uh, Minister. Um, well, uh, the, I'm sure the, the, uh, the uh, uh, congratulations were well received by the Very Finance well. Secretary for his double 20, as he, as he put it. Um, we, um, we certainly, when we announced the spending, our intention was to, to accelerate spending and ensure that there was a quick stimulus to local economies uh, across Scotland. And as at 31st of March of uh, this year, £86 million had been spent with the balance of £14 million uh, and expected to be spent in the current financial year. In some projects, there was a commitment given to ensure that there was legal, a legal closure on the deal to ensure that funding was committed for the current financial year. So that's why spend didn't happen before March 2017. Uh, and so we are looking to uh, see those impacts come forward. And in terms of the economic impact of the projects that has arisen, obviously, in, including in some cases when the spend is yet to occur, but will happen in this financial year. It's not yet possible to monitor the impact, but there's a detailed list uh, which may help the member, which has been supplied. 
in a response by the Finance Secretary, Derek Mackay, to uh, Jackie Bailey on the 7th of July, which sets out uh, quite a lot of detail about each of the individual projects which have been commissioned and sets out where we can do at this stage the anticipated employment impact and the composition of each of the projects that has been commissioned. So I hope that will help the member understand both the, uh, the nature of the projects and also the anticipated economic impact in the longer term. Try squeezing question seven from Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the economy and jobs are being supported through initiatives such as the Scottish Growth Scheme. Camera Secretary, Keith Brown. As the First Minister set out in the programme for government yesterday, the Scottish Government has continued to take action across a range of areas to support the Scottish economy and jobs. Uh, the Scottish Growth Scheme will support the economy and jobs by providing access to finance for companies that want to fund growth and export expansion. We launched the first product under the scheme, the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme, on the 16th of June, a £200 million initiative bringing together investment from the Scottish Government to Scottish Enterprise, the EIF and private sector fund managers and expect to make announcements about further products shortly. Liz Smith. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, he knows that obviously uh, a year ago uh, the Government uh, launched the Scottish Growth Scheme and trumpeted it as a half a billion pound vote of confidence in Scottish business. However, the Sunday Times reported just a couple of weeks ago that in that year the scheme has yet to pay out cash to any business. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm when cash from the scheme will actually be made available to Scottish business? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the finance I've mentioned has been made available from now, but there are two parties to uh, allocating that uh, cash, and the other parties, uh, some of whom we're in discussion with already, are part of that process. It will depend upon the nature of the application and what further work is to be done for the application. But I think it's a very positive thing that we're making this finance available. Yeah. And part of the reason why it adds to confidence in the Scottish economy, why we see, for example, four that. times the growth in GDP in Scotland than we see in the rest of the UK. Uh, I'd like to see what the uh, Scottish Tories have got to say to the UK government about how they have to up their game to try and match what we're doing in Scotland, either in terms of GDP or in terms of growth. But it is important that we do continue to provide these uh, measures. I think this is a very important one. I say to Liz Smith, there are uh, applicants uh, currently engaging with the Scottish government to try and access this funding. Uh, we have to go through the diligence process. And of course, as soon as we've done that, we'll make the information available to Parliament. And finally, Willie Rennie. Uh, but this was announced with great urgency last year. Is the Minister actually saying that money has been given out from the Scottish Growth Fund? Because that's not what I understand is the case. Can he clarify the situation? Has Cabinet money been spent or is it not? Cabinet Secretary. I think if Willie Rennie had actually listened to my answer, I've just said to him that we're engaging with applicants to this fund and that takes time to do. And it will depend on the applicants themselves. And again, what's unfortunate is that Willie Rennie takes his cue these days from the Conservatives has refused to acknowledge the benefits to the Scottish economy, for example, in things like the new bridge to Fife, which I thought he might have been interested in, which has been a contributory factor to growth in Scotland. It would be good if he'd acknowledge that from time to time, instead of, as usual, tagging on the uh, coattails of the Tories, which seems his pre preferred method of operation. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions.